Before the video starts, just a quick reminder to go check out The Chilling App. If you can't get enough content from me here on this channel, myself and other narrators here on YouTube are going to be providing hours of unique and spine-tingling scary story narrations exclusively over on The Chilling App. There's new narrations from me added weekly, and there's new professional narrators constantly being added to the list. There's hundreds of scary stories to binge on, from monsters, paranormal, thrillers, and true scary stories. The Chilling App even has classic novels, vintage horror radio, and true crime stories. And this all can be enjoyed with their one-of-a-kind ambient menu, where you can mix in immersive and relaxing sound effects, like a crackling fire, dark storms, and chill rain, and adjust their volumes independently, and a sleep timer so you can drift off to dreamland without interruptions after. They even curated a sleep tight playlist with all the longest stories in one place. Click the link in the description or the pinned comment to try the free trial of the chilling app, and after that it's only $2.99 a month, which makes it completely ad and interruption free. And don't forget, Chilling is giving away a PS5 Super Bundle. There's another link below with simple instructions on how to enter, a winner will be decided December 10th, just in time for the holiday. Thanks so much friends, and enjoy the stories. There are two main components to the story. One, I used to make money on the side by selling the loot from storage unit auctions on Craigslist. Two, my brother spent some time in prison for almost killing a guy in a car accident while he was under the influence. Part one of the story takes place while my brother was in prison, and part two is the weekend of his release about six or seven months later. Part one. I bought the keys to this one storage unit that had a whole bunch of cool stuff in it. We're talking a big flat screen LED TV, back when those were still brand new, a laptop computer, and three vintage motorcycles. As you can imagine, I was pretty much over the moon and after I posted the Craigslist ads and the replies started pouring in, I knew I was on track to make a ton of money. The only trouble was I didn't really have any place to keep the bikes, so much to my wife's anger, I kept one in the garage, one in the TV room, and the smaller dirt bike in the hallway of our house. The only thing that kept her off my back was the promise that they'd fetch us a lot of cash, and in the advertisement I posted on Craigslist, I promised to knock 20% off the total asking price if someone bought all the bikes together, even more if the offer came fast enough. And what do you know? It seemed to work. I got a call a few days later from a guy who was offering cash for all three bikes, he could also bring his own bike trailer over to transport them away, which really was the answer to my prayers. So, the guy arranges a trailer, then calls me again one evening to confirm my address. I pass on my details, and he says he'll be stopping by in the morning. But during the call, every so often I had to stop giving the address so I could shush my two-year-old who was apparently still discovering just how loud they could yell. So more than once I had to apologize and start over. The guy looking to buy the bikes seemed like a little annoyed. Like the kind of annoyed when you know someone doesn't have kids of their own. But he still said he'd be over in the morning to pick them up. The next morning comes. I've got the bike all ready to go, but 10 a.m. comes and goes and there's no sign of the buyer. 10.30 a.m. rolls around and there's still no show, so I try giving the guy a call, only to find the phone had been disconnected. He wasn't just ducking me. He didn't try to make an excuse. The phone was just straight up dead. Don't get me wrong, my little Craigslist deals went sideways all the time. People tried to haggle you down at the last minute or simply change their minds so it wasn't like it was anything out of the ordinary. But a totally disconnected phone line. Very weird and you can understand why that particular cancel stuck in my mind. Part 2 like I mentioned previously, about six months after this little incident, my brother gets out of prison. As you can probably guess, it was a real intense time for our whole family, especially since he asked to move into my place until we could find a place to stay long term. I told him if he touched a drop of alcohol, he was out on his butt. But other than that, he could stay as long as he wanted. 
About two weeks into his stay, I was having a beer out on the porch after the kids had gone to bed when my brother came out to join me. I was a little apprehensive, thinking he might just be trying to get my guard down so he could ask for a beer or something, but I was just being paranoid, and we had a little heart-to-heart that night, me drinking Paps and him drinking Fago. We talked about stuff he'd missed, how mom and dad really felt about his conviction, but most relevant to this story, we talked about his time in prison. It was a long, meandering conversation that honestly is a little hazy on my part thanks to the beers, but I remember mentioning something about how I felt bad for him being locked up with all those scumbags. My brother's a jerk, but he's not a bad person. He was torn up after the accident, almost took his own life, and he took his jail time on the chin because he knew he deserved it. I just hated the idea of him being locked up with actual evil people, people that might hurt him, manipulate him, or coach him into being an actual criminal and not just some idiot who liked to drink too much. His reply kind of caught me off guard for a second because instead of telling me some story about talking to murderers or bank robbers, he says something like, there's actually some pretty good guys in there, you'd be surprised. I guess maybe I would. I mean, my brother ended up inside. All he made was one dumb but dangerous mistake. But still, I just guffawed and told him to give me one credible example. Then, I swear to God, He starts telling me this story about this biker guy he'd shared a cell with for a few months. He wasn't just any old biker dude either. He was president of the local chapter of quite a well-known one-percenter club. Not the kind of guy you want to mess around with, but apparently also a man with a code. He once told my brother a story about how one of his associates found a guy selling a bunch of motorcycles. He planned to get the guy's address roll up in the middle of the night, kill the guy selling them, then steal the bikes. The only reason they called the job off was because the associate had heard kids on the other end when he was talking to the seller on the phone. It took a minute for the penny to drop, but I remember interrupting my brother to ask where they'd seen the bikes advertised, and when he said online, I swear my heart rate went into overdrive for a second. I threw out a flurry of questions, asking him what website, what models the bikes were, where their prospective victims could have been located. My brother didn't have any answers to these questions, just a few vague answers before he hit me with a question of his own. I just straight up told him I thought the biker's mark was me, and I told him all about the bikes I'd won in the unit auction, how the buyer seemed to just drop off the face of the earth. To this day I'm convinced it was me, and that the only thing that kept me and my family safe were the whales of my toddler. My brother doesn't seem to think that was the case and insisted that the bikers only targeted other bikers, kind of like the way the mafia only kill and rob other mafia guys, but I'm not so sure. Like I said, even these days I have this feeling in my gut that screams, you dodged a bullet. I was always told that having kids would change my life. They just didn't tell me that it had saved my life at some point too. I used to use Craigslist a whole bunch and I only ever had one weird or creepy thing happen to me. To this day I still don't know if it was real or just some elaborate prank, but it definitely left me with a feeling of unease for a few weeks after. So I grew up here in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn, and my parents were fresh off the boat from Kazakhstan. I'll give you a minute to make the Borat joke I know you're dying to make, but once it's out of your system, understand that as Kazakhs growing up in Brighton Beach, I grew up hearing a wide variety of Slavic and Central Asian languages. I knew Kazakh from mom and dad, I learned a lot of Russian due to our neighbors. Heck, we even had a Uzbek landlord who lived on the ground floor, and my dad worked with a guy from Turkmenistan who used to sing me old Turkmen nursery rhymes. Needless to say, when it came to being a broke college student to NYU, and I heard people would pay for translation services on Craigslist, I was desperate enough to post an ad. I was surprised how many people needed translation work done 
but it was mostly inquiries stemmed from the Russian to English ad I posted in Russian, and only a handful of emails or calls came from people wanting the reverse. Then, one day I get an email from a random email address asking if I could translate some Russian into English. I replied saying sure, and they ended up emailing me two paragraphs of what looked like handwritten letters. I say they were letters, but they didn't have any names or addresses attached to them. Maybe there was an address and the guy just didn't show me the envelope or whatever, but either way, I noticed something was wrong almost right away. First of all, the paper was filthy. I could barely make out the lettering, but the sender assured me that he'd pay for whatever I could translate. Secondly, although the letters or notes were written in Cyrillic characters, it most definitely wasn't Russian. I told the person it'd take me a few days to get the translation done, making up some lie about being busy with college, but really, I was asking around my neighbors to see if any of them recognized the language. Eventually, a neighbor of mine recognized that the language was Serbian. They didn't speak any Serbian, but they knew enough to recognize it, and more importantly, they knew someone could translate it. I printed out two black and white copies of the photos, the lettering was more pronounced that way, then headed over to this old Serbian guy's apartment on Neptune Avenue. The guy was super friendly at first, inviting me in and offering me tea. I accepted, offering him a little box of bundavara, which are Serbian pastries, in return, mainly as a thank you for doing the translation for me. We sit down, he puts on his glasses, I hand him the printouts, and he begins to study them. He stops at one point to point out the obvious, very difficult to read. But as he continues, his happy little expression fades and he begins to look very, very serious. I'm just sitting there, notebook and pen in hand, ready to jot down what the notes say, but the Serbian guy isn't saying anything. I have to actually press him for even just an idea of what the notes said, and at that point, he just looks up at me and says, I don't know, I think it's something about the war. I assumed the war he was referring to were the series of conflicts in the former Yugoslavia. These were particularly cruel conflicts that often had an ethnic or religious slant to them, so as soon as he said that, I got a particularly bad feeling in my gut. When the guy had finally stopped reading, he looked at me from over his glasses and asked, Where did you get this? I was honest and I told him I had been sent it as part of a small translation business I ran through Craigslist. But who sent this? I had to tell him I didn't know. The email address was just a Hotmail account, some non-English word, and some numbers for a username, and it wasn't like I pressed my clients for any personal information. All I was interested in was their PayPal ID. The guy began shaking his head. I don't like this, he said. This is very bad. Very bad people sent you this, do you understand? At that point, I was so desperate to know what the note said that I was just about ready to strangle him and... In the politest way possible, I asked him to cut the nonsense and tell me what he'd read. I wrote all this down, and it's fragmented, and the translation might not be the best, but here it goes. In a large house found near Bostahovin, all the phone lines have been cut. No other means of communication. Don't believe the commander if he says we're doing fine. We finished off everyone in Fajhar. But everything since then, the situation has been worse and worse. It started after we marched into the hills near Brakovici. During the march, totally disappeared. We sent out a small patrol, but they too stopped answering their radios and we haven't heard from them since. Dragon thinks, afraid, but no one shows it. Found salvation when we came across the house. There were Turks inside and we took them outside. We had to cut off the girl's head to shut her up. The other bodies were still moving when we carried them away and tossed them. So many bullets, more didn't help. We buried them deep, but in the morning the pit had been dug up. They were gone. The Turk fighters here are different. Kolha, they only come at night. It's like they can see in the dark. You must ask command to send everyone, everyone they can, Kolha, or I'm afraid we won't live to see the dawn. I remember the chill that ran through the air when the guy stopped talking and 
I suddenly understood why he was so agitated after reading through the notes. I thought he might be able to provide some insight into what he thought was happening to the author, but apart from a brief primer of the Yugoslav civil wars, he couldn't say much. What he did say was that the Turks the author was referring to were most likely probably Bosnian Muslims as the Serb paramilitaries used Turk as a pejorative for them. But without any information on dates and units, it was almost impossible to discern who wrote the note and when it was written. However, it's quite clear that it was written to a person named Kolya or Kolha. Maybe a relative of the author or this Kolya person was looking for them years after the war. Maybe they weren't holding out hope of finding a live person either, and maybe one of them had crossed the Atlantic at some point since the early 90s, hence why it was me that got an email stemming from my Craigslist ad. These were all things that were running through my head at the time, and for the most part, the Serbian guy agreed, but he did have something to add before I left. Many bad things happened during the war, he said, and this too is very bad, but it's also, how you say, proklet. He used a Serbian word, but it was one with its roots in the Russian word of the same meaning, so it didn't need any translating. Cursed. I'm not going to lie. I was definitely freaked out by whatever vague story the notes told, but I just thought it was some small piece, a clue even in some wider, more tragic tale. I just went home, sent the original emailer their translation, got paid and went about my business. It wasn't until much later on that I started to really mull over what the notes said, and there was this one week where I basically obsessed over it, trying to interpret meaning filling in the gaps, and even googling a couple of the place's names. But I think it's that line that reads, bodies were still moving, that sticks with me the most. They talked about decapitating someone, and the body was still moving? I'm not saying anything supernatural was happening. I imagine a headless person is a lot like a headless chicken. But then I start to consider the part where it said, it's like they can see in the dark and my imagination really starts to run away with me. For quite a while, I'd have done almost anything to know what happened to the person who wrote those notes, but I think I'd be better off not knowing. Born February 12th of 1986 in Syracuse, New York, Philip Markov was the second and youngest son of Susan and Richard Markov, the latter of which was employed as a dentist. From an early age, Philip proved an exceptional student. He was bright, well-mannered, and outgoing, gaining membership of the National Honor Society while attending Vernon Verona Sherrill High School. After graduating in 2004, Markov enrolled as a pre-med student at State University of New York at Albany then went on to attend Boston University School of Medicine in 2007. By this time, he was also engaged to be married to a woman named Megan McAllister. Philip and Megan had met while volunteering at Albany Medical Center Hospital Emergency Room and had planned their wedding for the date of August 14, 2009. But the couple's wedding would never arrive, as Philip was harboring a dark, dark secret. You see, by day... Philip wore the mask of a young, upwardly mobile medical student. But by night, he took on another persona, one people would come to call the Craigslist Killer. On the night of April 10, 2009, a woman named Tricia Leffler made her way to the Weston Copley Place Hotel in downtown Boston, Massachusetts. Tricia was an escort and had arranged a date with a man over Craigslist who'd given her what she assumed was a false name. But fake or not, that name was her ticket to a room on the third floor of the hotel, where a man had promised her a generous amount for a night of her company. She later said that he seemed genuine, a little skittish perhaps, but nothing out of the ordinary for a first-timer. But when she knocked on the hotel room door and the man welcomed her inside, he proved to have a very different kind of fun in mind. Trisha remembered being told, don't look at me, as soon as they were alone, she then felt what turned out to be the barrel of a handgun being shoved in the back of her head before the man forced her to her knees. 
When he did so, she believed she was going to be killed. But when she felt him securing her hands behind her back with electrical tape, it seemed he had something even worse in store for her before the end. Luckily for Trisha, Trisha was relatively unharmed, as all her John cared to do that night was rob her of her valuables. But Trisha was no novice. She'd been robbed before, only this time, it was different. She later told police that unlike previous robberies, this perpetrator had seemed to take their time over the affair. He was obviously new to armed robberies, but she added that he exuded a sense of gratification while he restrained her, almost like he was getting off on the sickening power dynamic. She was later found bound and gagged on the hotel room floor by terrified housekeeping staff, who immediately alerted the Boston Police Department. 25-year-old Jalisa Brisman was a young model who lived in New York City, but her career had her taking trips all over the country. Most were legitimate modeling jobs, some were slightly less than wholesome. She used to tell me she would do these topless or bikini parties all over the country, said friend and photographer 34-year-old Matthew Terhune. They would pay her $1,000 to go to these really expensive parties and give drinks or pass out food. But she never said anything about being a call girl or an escort. When we questioned her about whether there was anything shady, she said, Oh no, that's gross. Regardless of her reasons, Jalisa's work brought her to the Boston Marriott Copley Place on the night of April 14th, 2009, and it would prove to be her last night on Earth. Much like Trisha Leffler, Jalisa had been given the false name of Andy, but it's likely she understood the need for discretion and headed up to the hotel room without a thought. But unlike the incident with Trisha, there seemed to be something Jalisa didn't like about the man she saw when he opened the hotel room. Perhaps he looked different from a picture he'd shown her, or perhaps it was because he was holding a pistol in his hand. Security cameras later showed that Jalisa had attempted to run, but had been dragged back into the room by the man inside. She was later found by housekeeping, but unlike Trisha Leffler, she was a bloody, lifeless mess, lying in a pool of her own blood on the carpet. Her attacker had dragged her into the room where she had apparently continued to resist him, enough for him to strike her with the base of his pistol. Jalisa went down but came up swinging, so the man struck her again and again and again until she lay bleeding and twitching on the carpeted floor. How in the world the hotel's occupants didn't hear the shot is a mystery, but when Jalisa Brisman's body was later found by police, she had a single bullet wound to her head, executed after her attacker fractured her skull. She only had a zip tie around one of her wrists, which means she'd fought valiantly until the very end. In the hours that followed, Boston PD homicide detectives found themselves poring over the Marriott's security camera footage when one of them noticed someone familiar. It was a man who looked remarkably similar to the suspect of their Weston hotel robbery of just a few days prior. Naturally, the police became very interested in apprehending the suspect before he could strike again. If he'd escalated from robbery to murder so quickly, there's no telling what havoc he might wreak in the near future. It took just 48 hours for their man to strike again. Cynthia Melton was an exotic dancer who danced at the Cadillac Lounge in Providence, but Cynthia had a side gig advertising lap dances on Craigslist. She was surprised how popular the ads were and found the private dances could sometimes be incredibly lucrative. On April 16th of 2009, she arranged to meet with a client she had met through the erotic services section at the Warwick Holiday Inn Express. The man had scheduled their meeting for 11 p.m., but once inside the room, a man wearing a baseball cap pulled a gun, made her lie face down on the floor, and bound her with the same type of plastic ties used on Brisman. The attacker then attempted to silence her with a ball gag, stuffing it into her mouth before securing the ties at the back of the head. Cynthia later told police that the tall, blonde young man had been extremely nervous, and that he was visibly shaking as he ransacked her purse for cash and credit cards, telling her, Don't worry. I'm not going to kill you. Just give me the money. Thankfully, at that point, Cynthia's husband happened to knock on the door as he became concerned at the dead silence inside the room. When he opened it, the tall blonde man pointed a gun at him, 
Both men fled the scene in terror, but it was yet another opportunity for the police to gather evidence on their suspect. They somehow managed to trace the phone he was using to a nearby Walmart and later discovered their attacker had purchased a baseball cap that was worn during the robbery. That was how the police discovered the killer's name, and his name was Philip Markov. On April 20th, Philip Markov was apprehended during an apparent routine traffic stop in Walpole, Massachusetts, while he and his fiancée were on their way to Foxwoods Casino in Connecticut. During his 70-minute police interview, Megan McAllister vehemently defended her boyfriend, denying he had anything to do with the Boston Hotel murders. Oh no, 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 he tells me everything. He doesn't go on Craigslist, she said. I mean, he's not going to find work or anything, you know? When asked if he seemed to be spending a lot of nights away from their apartment, McAllister found the idea absurd. He doesn't have any great friends, she said. He has a couple friends at BU that I don't even know that well, but we don't hang out with people that much. We don't have money to go out, so it's like we're in the apartment 24-7. He doesn't have a life because he's in medical school. When detectives showed her surveillance photos of Markov taken on one of the nights of the crimes, she began to realize they believed that her fiancé resembled the suspect. Yet still, she defended him. He complains about money all the time, that, you know, we have no money so he's not going to rob somebody, she said. He'll go to the casino to try to win money. He's not going to rob somebody. Markov also denied being the Craigslist killer, but by then, police had tracked emails he had sent Brisbane to his Quincy apartment, and one of his victims had identified him from a picture. When police took him in for questioning that day, he was so arrogant that he was wearing the shoes he wore the night of Brisbane's killing, with her blood still splattered on them. Detectives asked if he had been at any downtown hotels in recent weeks, if perhaps he might have been meeting with women behind his fiancée's back and was too ashamed to admit it. Sometimes, Philip, when things like this happen, cheating I mean, it's a pretty ugly situation. Detective Dennis Harris is reported to have said, We don't mean them to happen. It doesn't make you a bad person but it only makes things worse if you lie about it. After repeated questioning about where Markov was on the night of the crimes, Detective Harris asked if he was getting frustrated. Yeah, because you keep on asking me the same questions, Markov said. I didn't tie up and rob anybody. I told you I don't know what you're talking about. So can you get me an attorney? Markov was still insistent on his innocence when the police chose to detain him on grounds he was a flight risk. His fiancée, on the other hand, was beginning to doubt him. Is there any reason for me to be, like, scared to go home with this person? She asked. Do you have any reason to fear him? One of the detectives replied. Megan told him no, that she wasn't scared of Markov. But what we also know is that she didn't go back to their Quincy apartments that evening, instead heading back to her native New Jersey to be with her parents. Clearly, she knew something terrible had happened something Markov wasn't innocent of. On April 21st, when Markov was arraigned in the case of Brisman's murder, the prosecutor stated that a semi-automatic handgun, wrist restraints, and duct tape had been found in Markov's apartment, all of which matched the varieties used at the crime scenes. Markov made several attempts to take his own life while being held at the Nishua Street Jail. One attempt was made three days after his arrest, and this seems to have been the incident that confirmed his guilt in most people's minds. Even after the gun and duct tape was found at his apartment, Markov's fiance was insistent on his innocence. She called him beautiful inside and out. But after him attempting to take his own life, she seems to have accepted his guilt. Markov then made an additional attempt at taking his own life after his fiance called off the wedding, and another attempt on the day his wedding was to have taken place. On June 11th, she visited Markov a second time and told him she did not plan to see him again for a long period of time, if ever. At various times, he was on watch or in the jail's psychiatric unit, but it seems Markov wouldn't let anything stand between him and the abyss. On August 15th of 2010, exactly one year and one day after his wedding was to have taken place, Philip Markov 
was found dead in his jail cell. He had somehow crafted a knife using a pen, an open flame, and a piece of metal, a common method for creating what's known as a prison shank. He then used this makeshift blade to open up arteries in his ankles, neck, and legs. Philip had also blocked off his own airway with a wad of toilet paper before placing a plastic bag over his head, tightening it with a roll of gauze that had been smuggled out of the prison's infirmary. The correctional officers who discovered Markov's body were horrified to discover that he had written his former fiancé's name and their pet names for each other in blood on the cell wall. Photographs of Markov and Megan McAllister were scattered all around his lifeless body, almost like they were the last images Markov wanted to see before clinical death set in. Some of us might be glad to hear that a predator killer who targeted some of the most vulnerable people in society, met his end in a miserable, painful way. But spare a thought for Megan McAllister. Markov taking his own life was highly publicized in the weeks following his demise, and we can safely assume that Megan got word of how her name was written in blood on Philip's cell wall. Perhaps this was his own messed up way of apologizing, but it's also clear that the act is one that will haunt Megan for the rest of her natural life. A reminder of the man she wanted to marry, a man who turned out to be a monster, who wrote both her name and his story in blood. In October of 2011, when 51 year old divorcee David Pauly learned his Craigslist job application had been accepted, he was elated. For the past few months, he'd been unemployed and was so broke that he'd been forced to sleep on his brother's couch in Norfolk, Virginia. So, when he got the good news about his job, and the prospect of making a cool $300 a week was nothing short of a godsend. Not only that, but he had been promised a two-bedroom, all-amenities trailer to reside in, completely free of charge. The ad had read, Wanted, Caretaker for Ohio Farm. Simply watch over a 688-acre patch of hilly farmland and feed a few cows. You get $300 a week in a nice two-bedroom trailer. Someone older and single preferred, but will consider all. Relocation a must. You must have a clean record and be trustworthy. Nearest neighbor is a mile away. The place is secluded and beautiful. It'll be a real getaway for the right person. Job of a lifetime. If you are ready to relocate, please contact ASAP. The only drawback was the prospect of relocation. But then David remembered an old high school friend who'd moved up to Ohio a few years prior and had managed to turn his life around. That was the decider, and shortly afterward, David drafted an email to send to the advertisement's poster, a man who called himself Jack. A few days later, David received a reply back from Jack saying that he had narrowed his list down to three candidates. Shortly after that came the confirmation call. David's older brother, Richard Pauly, remembered how happy he was when the call finally came. He was yelling, I got it, I got the job, Richard later said. Then he immediately called his buddy of his up in Ohio mall and started talking a mile a minute. He swore that this was the best thing that had ever happened to him and said he couldn't wait to pack up and go. Chris Mall, David's buddy up in Ohio, found himself in tears when he got the news. He's long taken to calling David his brother from another mother and had been deeply concerned for his old friend following what had been a messy, bitter divorce. It was like, maybe this is the turning point, and things are finally going the right way, Maul later said. The two friends arranged to meet up during David's first week in Ohio, with Chris promising to help him settle in. After that, all that was left was to pack up his belongings and hit the road. David arrived at the Red Roof Inn in Parkersburg, West Virginia on the night of Saturday, October 22, 2011. His journey was almost over and just before bedding down on the roadside hotel, David called his old friend Chris, who told him to give him a call when he was all settled into his new living quarters. Yet when the next day came and went, Chris hadn't heard back from David and he began to grow concerned. He contacted David's brother, Richard, who in turn provided him with the landline number for his friend's new employer, the mysterious Jack. To Chris's relief, 
Jack answered his call to warmingly assure him that David had arrived safely at the farm. In fact, he'd only just parted ways with him and his lack of contact could be explained by the fact that the farm was out of reach of cell phone towers. Jack added that he supposed David hadn't called because he'd been busy familiarizing himself with the vast surrounding farmlands, an excuse which made perfect sense to Chris. Jack then assured him that he'd get David to call as soon as possible, and the men ended the conversation on good terms. When a few more days passed and David still hadn't called, Chris Maul began to worry. He called Jack on his farm's landline again, only to be informed that David had apparently packed all of his things into his truck before taking off for Pennsylvania, apparently to work on a drilling rig for a more generous salary. Again, it was an excuse that made all the sense in the world, but for some reason, it just didn't sit right with Chris. The two men had been best friends since high school, and despite living in different cities and states over the years, they always kept one another informed of their whereabouts. David had been beyond excited to hook up with his old drinking buddy, so the idea that he'd just taken off without a word just seemed odd. Around two weeks after Chris Small's last contact with his old friend, he contacted David's twin sister to see if she'd heard from him. He was told that not only had Debbie not heard from David, but she'd been practically glued to her laptop for the past two weeks, conducting what amounted to an amateur investigation into her brother's disappearance. She went on to tell Chris that she'd made an incredibly disturbing discovery. She'd discovered that although it was indeed in an isolated area, there was a small town named Cambridge a few hours' drive from Jack's farm. She then poured through articles from the town's news website, The Daily Jeffersonian, only to find something that made her blood run cold. The November 8th headline read, Man says he was lured here for work, then shot. The article didn't mention the name of the victim, but it did mention that he'd been hired to work on a 688-acre ranch and that the noble county sheriff, Stephen Hanum, was working day and night to find the perpetrator. Debbie had called the sheriff's office immediately and was waiting patiently to hear back. Five days before Debbie's call, deputies had been contacted by the shooting victim from the headline she'd read, a man named Scott Davis. Davis told the deputies that he'd seen the ad for the job on Craigslist, but when he'd arrived at the farm, his prospective employers had tried to murder him. Stephen Hanum was terrified that David Pauly hadn't been so lucky, and so the next day, the sheriff's office called an FBI cybercrime specialist to help them get information about who had written the Craigslist ad. They also sent a crew with a cadaver dog back to the woods where Davis had been shot, just in case the worst had already happened. On the day of the search, one FBI agent recalled what he described as a torrential downpour and how the howling of nearby coyotes gave the search an ominous feel. Shortly before sunset, the search team found a patch of disturbed soil covered with broken twigs. They scraped away some of the dirt with their hands, and they discovered blood seeping from the wet earth. And before long, they unearthed a socked foot. The body was face down, and around one wrist was a corded black leather bracelet with a silver clasp. A police officer contacted David's sister and described the bracelet and that's how she found out that she'd never see her brother ever again. Next to the site at which David was buried was a second empty grave, one that had surely been meant for Scott Davis. Just days later, law enforcement was studying security camera footage taken from a roadside diner. In it, they observed Scott Davis meeting a man for breakfast. They knew it was the same man that had offered him the farm job, and possibly the same man that had killed him. Shortly afterward, the FBI cybercrime specialist managed to scrape together enough information from Craigslist to trace the original post's IP address to a small house in Akron, Ohio. When the investigators arrived at the house, the homeowner told them he'd never been on Craigslist in his life, nor did he know anyone named Jack. However, when the FBI agents showed him a picture of the man they believed to be Jack, the homeowner recognized him. He told the agents the man had rented a room from him for $100 a week and that his name was Ralph Geiger.
Real nice guy, the man reportedly said. Didn't cuss, didn't smoke, didn't drink. Went to church every Sunday. The agents asked if the man had a contact number for this Ralph Geiger, and he did. The same homeowner then called Geiger and kept him on the line as the FBI traced the call. This led the November 16th SWAT raid on the house in Akron, Ohio, yet when their target was detained, they discovered his name wasn't Ralph Geiger, and that in fact Ralph Geiger was already dead. The man they now had in custody was named Richard Beasley, but Beasley hadn't been working alone. Scott Davis had mentioned that Beasley had been in the company of a young man named Brogan. This Brogan turned out to be a junior at the nearby Stowe Monroe Falls High School named Brogan Rafferty. The FBI intercepted Brogan while he was at school, interviewing him in the principal's office while partnered agents searched the boy's home. Brogan later told his mother that before he left school that day, he had found a girl he liked and kissed her, even though her boyfriend was nearby. He had been worried that he'd never see her or anyone else from his high school again. He was right to worry, but not because he'd kissed anyone, because that evening, police arrived with a warrant and he was promptly arrested. Meanwhile, other FBI agents dug up everything they could on the mysterious Jack. Jack turned out to be none other than Richard Beasley himself. Richard was born in 1959 and raised primarily by his mother, who worked as a secretary at a local high school. He married and had a daughter named Tanya, who was about the same age as Brogan Rafferty, and held down various machinist jobs over the years in between prison spells. He'd done five years on burglary charges in Texas and another seven in a federal prison for a firearms violation. One FBI agent later said that Richard looked like an evil version of Santa, with his wild eyebrows and bushy white beard. He also seemed to have mobility difficulties, which apparently stemmed from an incident in the mid-2000s when a dump truck hit Richard's car, leaving him with head, chest, and spinal injuries. After the accident, Richard told people he'd found God, and began to spend a lot of time at a local megachurch known as The Chapel. He also became heavily reliant on opiate-based medications and his addiction wreaked havoc on what was already a chaotic lifestyle. Acquaintances had described Richard as lazy and a scam artist, but assured police he was relatively harmless and had never once lost his temper in the time they'd known him. But it seems Richard had a dark side, one that he revealed to very few people in his life. Amy Saller, a self-described former crack addict and escort, knew Richard after meeting him at a halfway house. He told me his mission was to save all the girls that are on the streets, she later stated. I pictured him as a savior, somebody that was trying to help me, but he didn't want to help. All he wanted to do was use us. Richard bought cell phones for many of the girls at the halfway house, but instead of using them to touch base and keep them on the right track, Richard essentially became their pimp. He began advertising their services online before driving them to meet John's. Amy added that Richard would do anything in his power to keep the girls at the house, including having them relapse on their addictions just to keep them pliant. Amy said that although she never saw Beasley get violent, all the girls feared him. He was a manipulator, a man who implied violence, and although he generally kept his cool, they knew he was perfectly capable of inflicting serious harm. In early 2011, Richard was arrested in Ohio on narcotics charges. While he was locked up, investigators began building an additional case against him, but when he was released on bond in mid-July, he went on the run from the law. Richard desperately needed to disappear, and when he realized his ticket was to assume a new identity, his deep-seated predatory nature had him coming up with a deeply sinister plan. Instead of vulnerable young women he would target vulnerable older men, men with so few connections to the world around them that once he'd robbed them of their lives, he could rob them of their names. One week after arresting Brogan Rafferty, investigators offered the 16-year-old suspect a deal. If he agreed to testify against Richard Beasley, he would be charged only with complicity to murder. Bizarrely, Brogan would later renege on the deal, but the initial conversation was recorded, 
and a judge later allowed it to be presented to the jury during his trial. According to Brogan, Richard had been open about the fact that he was on the lam and needed this help to keep him from going back to prison, and the first thing he needed for that was a new identity. Richard began hanging around local homeless shelters, hunting for someone who bore a close resemblance to him, but in the end, he decided that working remotely and anonymously would yield both effective and discreet results, and so he turned to the internet. Richard presented himself as a wealthy, hands-off, but demanding employer who was offering the job of a lifetime. It was the perfect bait in a country that was still very much in the grasp of a grinding recession, and the way his Craigslist ad painted a picture of a cowboy-esque lifestyle led to him receiving literally hundreds of applications. One of these applications was from a man named Ralph Geiger, a 56-year-old man who had recently been down on his luck. He'd also grown up on a farm which he believed made him ideal for the job. Beasley quizzed him on his size and his looks, but we now know that this wasn't so much for the purposes of recognizing him as a potential meeting. It was so Beasley could be sure they bore a resemblance so he could steal his identity. Brogan Rafferty would later claim that he had no idea what was coming and was completely horrified when they drove Geiger out to the same spot in the woods where they would later take David Pauly and Scott Davis only to shoot him in the back of the head. It was as if somehow I immediately slipped into a dream or something, Rafferty told the FBI, like I had ice in my veins. From then on, Rafferty claimed that he lived in an almost constant state of fear and panic, terrified that Beasley would hurt his family if he told anyone what had happened. FBI agents later found a poem saved to his computer's hard drive. Some of the lines read as follows. We took him out to the woods on a humid summer's night. The loud crack echoed and I didn't hear the thud. He threw the clothes in a garbage bag along with the personal items. I dug the hole. We put him in with difficulty. They call them stiffs for a reason. We showered him with lime like a satanic baptism. It was like we were excommunicating him from the world. Felt terrible until I threw up. When I got home, I took a hot shower and I prayed that night. While Brogan was trying to process the murder through poetry, Richard Beasley was busy transforming himself into an entirely different person. He dyed his hair brown, then used Ralph Geiger's credentials to rent an apartment, order prescription pain meds, and apply for several machinist jobs. The work no longer suited Richard, and he believed that the murder had gone so smoothly that he could turn it into a career of sorts preying on other men who'd fallen on hard times. So, he placed yet another job ad up on Craigslist, one that would lead to David Pauly filling up a U-Haul and driving his stuff up to rural Ohio. About the same time he was hitting the road, Richard and Brogan were digging the man's grave. Richard Beasley had firmly believed that no one would come looking for the divorced, lonely middle-aged men whose lives he sought to steal. But not everyone was unloved and unwanted as he, and in the end, it was the love of a twin sister that brought down one of the most monstrous killers who ever stalked the Midwest. In November 2012, a jury convicted Brogan Rafferty of two dozen criminal counts, including murder, robbery, and kidnapping. The judge told Rafferty that he had been dealt a lousy hand in life, but that he had embraced the evil and sentenced him to life without parole. The following year, Richard Beasley was also convicted of murder and was sentenced to death. Throughout his trial, he maintained that he was innocent, but for a man who was willing to kill, over and over to maintain his freedom, what are just a few more lies on top of a bill for murder? My brother, I miss him every day. We know how he died because he passed away in our parents' spare room. There's just a big gap between him deciding to backpack around Mexico and the state he was in when he finally returned. So, he saw an advertisement on Craigslist for a job on a ranch down in Mexico and since he was taking a year out before college, 
He figured it'd be the perfect way to expand his mind a little before heading off to lose himself in books. Anyway, I think it was June. He packed up his stuff and headed off to the bus station where a bus would take him down to El Paso. My mom and dad get a phone call a few days later just letting them know he'd arrived safely on the ranch. There were a bunch of other Americans there apparently, hence why the ad mentioning something about fluency in Spanish not necessary and he was settling in nicely after getting a general orientation. He then promises to call back every week or so just to keep our parents updated on what's going on, if he needed anything mailed to him and stuff like that. Then one week, the phone call stopped. Mom and Dad tried calling the ranch he was working at only to be told my brother had moved on. They'd exhausted trying to call his little prepaid cell phone. It used to just ring out, but one day it was disconnected, so there was basically no reaching him. Not long after, Mom and Dad reported him missing, and this grim realization set in that we might not ever see him ever again. About four or five months after he'd first departed for Mexico, and with the police still having no idea where he was, Mom and Dad got a knock on their door. Dad says he was terrified to be the cops with the news that they'd all been terrified of getting, but he says he was so happy that he burst into tears when he saw that the person at the door was none other than my brother. Only he wasn't like how he remembered. He'd gone out there looking healthy and feeling happy, and he came back skeletal with a crippling addiction to opiates. We never really got to the bottom of how he'd gotten hooked. He only talked about his time in Mexico once, and it was super vague and nondescript. Mom and Dad got him on a methadone program hoping it would help him get clean, but it turned out to be the thing that killed him. Swallow too much of the stuff one night and just never woke up. I try not to wonder about him too much, like I'm not really sure I want to know what changed him so much, what he saw or did to cause such a drastic transformation. I just try to remember him at his best, how the best big brother ever went down to Mexico for a summer, but how someone completely different came back. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about all the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, dragons love clown meat.